Yeah, but, but uh, I, I wanted to start this talk, you, you know, with a couple of things you, you've done lately. And uh, first, uh, I wanted to ask you about the Manhattan transfer. You, you know, you've been touring. They had like the, the <laughs> 50th anniversary, right? Or that was the idea, I think. Uh, uh, they have the 50th anniversary. And uh, also, uh, I'm quite happy about it and uh, somewhat proud, even though pride is, has... Uh, very little to do with all all of this, but uh, in the 50 years uh, of the illustrious career, they never used the working band to record. Uh, they would always place it in the hands of the producer, who would typically yeah. hire LA studio cats to do the uh, the recording. Uh, they used the working band uh, along with the WDR uh, Symphony from Cologne. Yeah, uh, we toured. with those uh, of 2020 and when the 50 hit they decided to make a recording and uh, it was uh, another blast project because you know it was 2021 springtime very few gigs very few uh, chances to play together and they called this project and basically uh, we were starting it in the studio in Jersey along with uh, Yaron Gashowski and uh, Cliff Alman and Ross Peterson uh, and then they send this recording to Germany, the symphony put their tracks, and then they send it to Los Angeles, and singer, mm -hmm. singers went there and uh, finally put everything on. And, uh, yeah, it's great. And uh, touring came back. I even remember the date. It was a uh, tour in particular with Manhattan Transfer. It was September of 2021. That's uh, the first time I got on the plane. <laughs> oh, wow, shit. Oh, man. Uh, pretty incredible feeling, you know, to go somewhere. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. It was a jet festival in Detroit as a first stop. And uh, I was on the same uh, plane with uh, my old friend and colleague, the great drummer Jonathan Blake. And he was flying for the same festival. And uh, I was saying, man, I'm so excited to fly to Detroit. And he, he jokingly, he said, Man, do you even hear yourself? Like you excited to? That would be the last exciting place to go to, you know, at all times and ages. And all of a sudden, I'm excited to go to Detroit. <laughs> how, how did you end this with this gig? Actually, with Manhattan Transfer, how, how did they contact you? I mean, like, what was the connection? Uh, uh there were multiple connections actually. Uh, the uh, musical director and keyboardist and arranger, and uh, matter of fact, he arranged half of uh, all the music, including symphony and everything, on the new record. And the other half was done by the great Vince Mendoza, mm, okay. whom we met while being in Cologne, because he, I understand, he's one of the uh, directors, uh, or like you know, maybe director in residence at the time for WDR Big Band, and uh, we met him, and I guess, you know, singers decided to ask him to write uh, some arrangements. So, Yaron Gershovsky, who's been the musical director since 1979, I met him in the 90s when oh, well. I was oh. just making my inroads into the scene, and I was lucky to have some recording uh, jobs and basically the recording scene was already kind of dying out uh, few you know far in between uh, were maybe some you know occasional R&B and some ethnic Jewish recordings yeah. and there was kind of like you know not a solid built team for that but uh, you know recurring people would take part in it and Yaron was, uh, when he wasn't on the road, he would be in the studio a lot, and he did a lot of writing, and uh, eventually he did his own recording, of which I was 
uh, also part of, I think it was 1997 mm. or 98. Uh, and that was the first connection. Uh, so I knew him for a long time. And the uh, kind of nudge in the direction of uh, me winding up being in the band was that Janice Siegel, with whom I started working, I, I also knew her for a long time, and she's real New Yorker. She's real, yeah. uh, you know, West Village kind of person. I would be playing a gig somewhere, uh, like my own gig at the place called Cachaça, which is no longer there. It was run by uh, the Brazilian bassist Chitos Ribas, who's no longer with us either. So, uh, may he rest in peace. Uh, he hired uh, bass players as leaders. Oh, living wow. in, in okay. such wow. a format. So I remember playing there and George Colligan, great keyboardist, mm -hmm. pianist, uh, whom we really miss because he, he moved from New York. He now teaches in Portland for really? almost oh, 10 wow. years. Oh, okay. Wow. Uh, he, he was working with Janice at the time, and he just said, like, oh, I'm playing here. She would come and sit in and sing a few songs and be really cool and friendly and eventually she hired me for her uh, things for her solo stuff and then I guess the question popped when there was a time a need for a basis in the transfer they asked me first as a sub uh, I subbed out a couple of times in 2013 and then in 14 they invited me for a tour mm -hmm. and I stayed ever since and anyway, they they truly classy and uh, beautiful people to uh, to work for because they understand that you have uh, your own uh, musical needs and your career outside of just playing behind them. So anytime, of course, ahead of time, I ask them to let me go for a month or for a yeah. particular time period. Uh, there's never a question. Just go do your thing. Come back when you can. So I really appreciate the type of arrangement yeah. yeah that's beautiful yeah it's it's a high profile gig it's it's nice you know that you can do those gigs and you know do your own stuff and some other small gigs it's a it's a nice combination or balance i'll put it like that you know yeah yeah well i've been with the mingus big band and all other mingus configurations yeah. for 25 years at this point. Matter of fact, right about now, it would be 25 years. I started in, I think, March 98, or maybe late February. And, you know, that's kind of like, I call it the gig where my name is on, on the marquee. So uh, I write for this. I, you know, I'm, I'm on the chair of musical director uh, most of the time. So, you know, I do that as well. And transfer and they understand that when I have to go on the road with a man, sure. that's kind of my first priority. And you know, and Mingus people, Sue, uh, who left us in September uh, at 92, she ran the band uh, all those years, you know, she created the band. She was also understanding of you having a career outside of Mingus man. And that kind of carried over the same way. I try to give it the priority and I enjoy the gig and it's like my musical family. Uh, but at the same time, if something else, you know, some recording that I really want to be part of sure. comes up, then that's, I'm going there and then no questions asked on, on, on the part of the Mingus band. Yeah. Like, look, you have to go. It, it's a uh, really, like these people really know how to respect musician and musicianship. So important, yeah. Like I, I, I wanted to ask you about Domingo's big band, yeah. ob obviously later. But since you brought it up, like how, how did you end up doing this gig actually, and what's the story behind it? I mean, how, how did you end end up there? And uh, I mean, you being a bass player in Mingus, it's okay with the first hit connection, but still, you know. Yeah, I know it's. Uh, I I probably told that story probably uh, over a hundred times, but I love. I still love telling oh, please. it. Please, I didn't hear because you. it's. Uh, <laughs> there, there are a few, uh, you know, pointers to 
things that people believe and that Sumingos believed in, uh, uh, a lesson in democracy for me, <laughs> in, in a way. Uh, so I met Sumingos while uh, I had a lucky chance when things started opening up. Uh, politically and, and border-wise, and uh, I was just back from the army. That I, I spent two years serving in the army in Ukraine. I was oh, mostly man. playing in the in the marching band, but I did other things oh. as well. And I was back, and all of a sudden, uh, there's so many opportunities in Moscow. And it's not because I'm so great, and it's not because uh, they didn't have enough musicians. I mean, they had some guys, you know. But uh, the thing is, the commercial opportunities opened up. So a lot of people who mm -hmm. used to be working for Flow Money Band, they just wanted to do commercial work for them because uh, private enterprise was allowed, private restaurants opened up. Uh, so I come back and I become part of the studio band, which uh, was assigned to the, the only government label in USSR called Melodia. And uh, there was a very comfortable work because they had their own equipment, their own instruments. And, uh, you know, I got experience in recording stuff. They were kind of like, you know, wolves. Uh, I was the youngest guy and it's live recording for a singer, whatever, you know, the music would be. If you make a mistake, nobody will tell you anything, but you feel the vibe. It's like they're ready to just like sing their teeth in you because you're taking their time now, like you're on their time. They just want to do one or the most two takes and move on and then pack up and go. That band uh, eventually, again, the times were changing. So there were less and less of the money coming from the government towards yeah. the government supported recordings. So that studio band needed uh, more work than the government could provide now. Uh, this restaurateur, uh, whose name was, uh, I can't remember his last name, but the, his first name, his last name was Fyodorov. And he became very successful as a private restaurateur in Moscow. And he was looking to open up a restaurant in, uh, with Russian cuisine in Long Island, New York. And he wanted to have a classy swing band playing there for listening and dancing pleasure, quote unquote. Uh, naturally, Melody is a combo with five horns. It, there was probably at the time no other band of that caliber in Moscow who would be so together, like playing together for years and years. So we got an engagement to play in Long Island for uh, in, initially was one month, but we stayed for five. Oh, wow. Okay. During that time, I went to hear and see everybody I could. I met, I had a chance to meet uh, John Anderson and Rufus Reed and you know, with Rufus, I kind of held this relationship for, for a while, uh, for a long time, up until now. And we did a three bass thing at some point with Jalen Hart. It's really nice. And rehearsed at his uh, studio so many times. Mm. Jonathan Blake and John Blake. I mean, he also rest in peace, beautiful mm. man. Amazing violinist. So uh, I met so many musicians, and while being here, I was brought by a mutual friend to Sue Mingus' apartment, which is actually uh, is, is going to be hard to, to turn things now, and I have the screen behind me anyways, but uh, the last Mingus' apartment and, and uh, last uh, Mingus' workshop office was in the building next to me, on the oh, wow. same floor as I am. I'm on 43rd floor, Mingus, Mingus' last apartment was on 43rd floor in, in the 10th Avenue building. Oh, well. And the reason they chose it because Mingus was in the wheelchair and he needed the elevator. And uh, his apartment on 10th Street in the village, it was a walk-off, so naturally he had to move somewhere. So uh, the reason somebody brought me to meet Sue Mingus was that they were going to Moscow shortly, and uh, it was a production of Epitaph, a famous Mingus' piece, which uh, he uh, titled Epitaph because he knew there'd never be enough resource and time to play during his lifetime. 
So thanks to Sue, Andrew Hamzi, and Gunther Schuller, and uh, you know a few contributors, uh, this has happened a few times. And actually, the the next installation of Epitaph will be at Yale University on April second, which which is oh, wow. Sue Mings's birthday, oh, and wow. it's going to be basically Mings's big band musicians plus Yale students. Like. Oh, wow. Along, you know, I think it's a great thing. We'll be working alongside. Like, I'll be playing bass, and then I'll be a bass student playing bass too. And the same yeah, goes for six trumpets. They're gonna be three of ours and three of theirs. Yeah. So the same was about to happen in uh, the summer of '91 when I was coming back to Moscow from that uh, restaurant engagement, and Sue was just looking for people who could show them around, maybe, and who could help, you know, who, who provide a little extra help, uh, they wound up not needing extra help as far as translation and, uh, you know, all that goes. But nobody really wanted to show them around. And I went, when I returned to Moscow, I went to every rehearsal and I hung with them. And I offered to take them on a, on a day off just to show them the city, mostly the center, the architectural parts of it. My English was uh, enough to do yeah. so. And I really took them around and they were very grateful. And uh, along with Sue, I met uh, uh, Gunther Schuller's son, Edmund, who was playing bass. Uh, I met uh, my future colleague uh, in the Mingus Orchestra, Basunis Michael Rabinovitz. Mm, oh, yeah. And I met one of the most one of the most brilliant saxophone players uh, and one of the most, like, inquiring mind uh, and that's the great Craig Handy who's uh, after a little hiatus over a few years of playing with the Mingus band he's back and he's uh, really uh, an incredible resource he actually played Mingus's music since the 80s when mm -hmm. Sue just put together the Mingus dynasty the combo and I heard Craig play sometimes when I would be in the audience and he would just blow me away. One time I heard him play at Ort Leibs with Orrin Evans. And I played just before that and I stayed and they were kind of like the house men. And it just blew me away. And going back to 98, he, he was in Herbie Hancock's quartet for maybe eight or nine years. Mm. And I heard him play at, uh, JNR Festival downtown, I think the year maybe was 99. And I think he he conversed with Herbie on that level. He just, mm. he was so on and so in there. And he has huge sound. And uh, I know people come, my uh, classmate and little friend and uh, band leader for whom I work, you know, for the last 40 years, Alexander C. Piagin, the great trumpeter. Yeah, sure. He was uh, study, studying with Craig. Uh, we were on tour with the Mingus band, and he would be uh, studying breathing with him because oh, wow. uh, it's so important for the horn player to, to breathe. And uh, everybody saw that Craig's got it, that he has like a perfect balanced way. And he's sound and everything. So he was part of that uh, excursion in Moscow. So I kind of dwell on that story, and I hope the details of it are, could be interesting to somebody. But then uh, I come to New York, and in 92, one year after the creation of the Big Ben, I come over, and uh, Sue would not, she had so much stuff going on, she would not remember who I am. I said hello, and there was no recollection of, of like, oh, you're the guy in Moscow. And uh, the other guys, of course, remembered me, and Craig Candy would invite me to all sorts of jam sessions, and mm. uh, I met quite a few people through him. So uh, fast forward to 98, where I joined the band, and the little pre-story uh, to joining the band was uh, the fact that when I was serving, as I said, in the army in the city of Chernihiv, in Ukraine for two years, I only had uh, five cassette tapes with me. That's all I was allowed to, to keep. And two LPs. 
those two LPs was one of them was uh, LP by uh, tenor player Nikolai Panov, which is the first recording ever I was part of, mm. and that uh, was recorded a week before I went to the army. So as soon as it came out on LP, they sent one. The second LP was uh, Sonny Rollins's "Sunny Day, Starry Night." On uh, which the band was Bob Crenshaw on electric bass, Mark Soskin, uh, and Tommy Campbell on drums. So naturally, I had two years to concentrate and uh, to suck on every detail of that recording, along with five other tapes. Uh, which, you know, uh, now looking back, I think, uh, of course, information is, is important, but it's not too bad to have a limited amount of information that you can yeah. really, really yeah. work with. I can think back, back, you know, I had kind of blue. Yeah, what were tape. the tapes? Yeah, I wanted to ask you that, yeah. I had kind of blue. I had Pat Metheny rejoicing. <laughs> wow. Oh, yeah, I had I Keith Jarrett uh, a trio, which I transcribed quite a few things from. Uh, and then I had Wayne Shorter, Mikey Rest in Peace, Phantom Navigator. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the fifth one, I can't remember, but I remember that there were five albums on, and that's the extent to which I, you know, would be. So, obviously, every note, you know, everything that Paul yeah. Chambers played on kind of blue, I didn't even have to write it. I just, you know, I, I, I just kind of like, you know, soaked in it. So, when I come to New York, I remember all those names. And at the beautiful club called Visionis, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, it's no longer there, but now it's an R&B place. But it was right on the same block where the Blue Note was, and uh, it was great because you know Blue Note and Visionis would feed each other, and you would see a lot of great musicians from the Blue Note gig coming to Visionis. They were extremely friendly to young guys uh, who they, the owner and the managers, like they would let me come in and just, I would get a cup of coffee and just stay there. And I, I heard so much music there. Within the first year, because I started playing in the house band with Hassan Williams there, uh, they would ask me eventually to do a trio mm. on Saturday, the jam session. Eddie Henderson, the great trumpeter, yeah. Eddie Henderson would play there every Monday. Uh, and we would sub for him sometimes. So uh, when I saw... Tommy Kimball's name to appear on, on at Visiona's program. I'm like, I'm there. I'm going. So I came, and uh, I, I'd be there two or three times a week playing uh, at the jam session, whether I'd be in house band or not. Just coming in, and Ed Howard, great bassist, yeah. who's played with Roy Haynes so many years, and uh, he was playing with Eddie Henderson. He would let me sit in all the time, and he became a great friend. Uh, and uh, I, I was thinking of yeah the jam session and before I even come to Matt, to to meet Tommy Campbell, one of his students come in because he saw me play the session and he's a drummer student of Tommy's and he says oh you're a bass player right you want to come play on the street make some money tomorrow and, okay I don't have that many gigs or we have some Periods of time, no gigs. Yeah, let's go play. So, knowing Tommy Kimball provided me with that side of uh, a very interesting. It was not like a basking, what people call basking. We mm -hmm. didn't even have the term basking back in the early nineties. It, it was called hidden, and I doubt that now you would be allowed to do anything like what we did back then because uh, he had a full drum set. Oh, well. He would drive and and bring uh, other people's gear to the guitar head, uh, full blown amplifier. I I had he gave it to me to use. It was his own uh, 700 watt Black Widow PVM, and there'd be a percussion player there too, and the and the trumpet player who played two trumpets at the same time. Wow. Okay. And everything was powered by uh, one cylinder Honda generator, so it was not a pity kind of give us some money thing. It was more like in your face, and people would just stop. Like, 
what's happening here? I remember with that amp, my friend and an incredible bassist, uh, Matt Garrison, mm -hmm. he came up to us once uh, and he said, like, and we were playing uh, at Union Square, 14th Street, and he said, man, I could hear nothing but the bass from uh, West 4th Street, 10, 10 blocks away. That's the kind of uh, band that it was. And the importance of that street band for me was in that they would say, okay, let's play, you know, and he would call like whatever, what's going mm -hmm. on, Marvin Gaye, yeah. you know, Legacies. And I'd be like, what's that? Because I was completely, you know, just, a, I love jazz. I, I love uh, jazz, rock, and funk, but I didn't have that much knowledge about it, really. So he would uh, say like, oh, you know, it's Motown. I'd be like, what is Motown? Oh, you know, just go, go learn it. And right after the street hit would be over, I'd go to Fulton Street in Brooklyn, and outside there would be, be selling all sorts of music and tape mm. was the cheapest, most accessible, and you could listen to it in the little Walkman. So I would buy Best of Motown, and the next thing would be like, okay, let's play. How we're we gonna do this song? Okay, let's play it as Guaguan Ho. No, what is Guaguan Ho? Oh, it's a Cuban rhythm. Why didn't you? And I go and buy a book uh, by Lincoln Goins and Robbie Amin called Funky mm -hmm. Find the Club, and I would start studying light music. And then Bobby Sanabria one time at the gig met me and he realized that I don't know anything. He invited me to his uh, classes at Drummers Collective. Just come for free and, and check it out. And that was an incredible schooling too. So that street band filled a lot of gaps in my uh, otherwise, you know, not that full of uh, knowledge of music in general. Uh, you wouldn't say like jazz funk or anything, just like mm -hmm. time based American music of 20th century. You can call it that. Yeah. Uh, which, by the way, the education continues because uh, transfer, they so steeped in the history of vocal music that oftentimes they play things that I never heard before. I would maybe hear the name resonating somewhere, like, you know, Four Vagabonds, like this band, vocal band from. 20s, 30s, or like Fifth Dimension, there's a uh, great uh, R&B uh, singing quintet from, from the uh, 60s and 70s. Otherwise, I would not hear of or concentrate on this music. So like I say, the, the journey continues. <laughs> so Tommy Campbell would actually, he was very tight friend with Jamie Affamato, who was the drummer who invited me to play in the street. And I already had maybe other gigs and recordings and small gigs in the East Village. I would still keep playing with a street band because not only was that a solid, uh, you know, a piece of work, it was a solid piece of education. Yeah. And uh, I have to confess it's a special kind of adrenaline playing on the street because obviously we were playing sort of like simpler things and things that had to groove and things that had to bring in money. But it was pretty obvious that if you were not on it, like yeah. completely immersed in the group, it would not be happening and people would not really be stopping. Because people stop for the noise for the first 10 seconds, but if people want to hear something that sounds good and feels good, you really have to be on it. And that aspect, uh, was very attractive in actually street playing, and that's something that I miss now, even mm. though it's been you know 20 some years since uh, that happened last time. But I really miss that aspect, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Mm. And New York was much freer as far as rules go because now, if you do something like this in a crowded square like Times Square or Union Square. Within first ten seconds, the police would come and say you're exceeding the decibel levels. Yeah. For for uh, street playing, not even taking into account that you may be uh, breaching some safety rules by by big crowd gathering around you in between two uh, two streets, you know, stuff like that. Back then, uh, it was way you know better and way freer, and we could go and 
even if we were exceeding decibel level and even if uh, by the time the police would get a call from an office on the 20th floor of the building across by that time by the time the police would come we would already finish the set and you know make like 100 150 bucks each or so wow that's amazing uh we made made some tapes and eventually cds and sold uh, incredible amount of those too which was helpful uh tommy campbell lived close to union square that i mentioned he he was living in i think on 17th street and we were playing on 14th street and he would come out he would sit in oh, on wow. his student drum set, which was very much modeled on Tommy's, you know, setup. Then I remember one time Jamie's grandmother passed and he had to go, but we already uh, planned a set by the fountain in Central Park, which would last like six hours in, in the sun and everything. Tommy said, I'll do it, don't worry about it. He came out and Tommy was playing with Sonny Rollins at the time oh. and Manhattan Transfer. Uh, he would nevertheless come and do the set with, with us. Uh, eventually, Tommy got a gig with the Mingus band, and any time he would come around, he would have headphones, and he would be listening to the Mingus stuff all the time. And going back, I'm thinking, like, man, what a lesson that was, too, because he, uh, of course, you know, there were charts and everything, but first and foremost, uh, way of receiving and yeah. giving information is actual music, you know, listening yeah. to it is way more important than the page. And some of us, especially coming from maybe the Eastern Bloc, this scholastic way of learning is always of the page. And now looking back, one of the positive things of, about coming to New York and rubbing elbows with people here that taught me to uh, understand mu music with my ears first, you know, and with my heart second, and on only third would be the page. Yeah. You know, so Tom Tommy Campbell uh, did a few gigs, and there were a few other bands where Tommy would be part of the band, and we played. So in 98, like I said, late February, maybe early March, uh, Tommy recommends me for the Mingus band, which needed, I guess, a bass player, like, very quick. It was something like Sunday, and they were playing Thursdays at the Time Cafe on Lafayette Street at the time, which lasted from 91 until 2004. Wow. And in 98, uh, I get a phone call from Sam Mingus, who, again, she would not connect me to somebody who was hanging with them in Moscow for, for Epitaph. Uh, she calls me, she says, oh, you come on recommendation of Tommy Kimball, so uh, he says you can read and uh, we need a bass player this Thursday. Uh, would you be able to do it? Of course, I jumped in my seat, you know, listening to the message. It was before the uh, cell phones. I think we had cell phones, but there was no voicemail service yet. So everything was on, on the small cassette tape yeah. answering machine. Like, oh man, what beautiful uh, news that uh, tape was bringing from time to time. So there was one of those, and of course I uh, ask, I thank Tommy, and, and Tommy is super nice. He invites me to his uh, rehear uh, studio. They shared the studio with Jamie, his student on R Rivington Street. Actually, may many. Uh, amazing people had studios there, you know, where they would store instruments and rehearse from time to time. Tiny space, but you can fit quartet. Yeah. I remember hearing Adam Rogers there for the first time, this great guitarist, uh -huh. whom I was so lucky to play on many occasions in different bands. I remember listening to Adam Holzman, one of the uh, key keyboardists with Late Miles, yeah. who had studio there, and I, I heard them rehearse, and it was very uplifting. So. Tommy brings me there on Tuesday, like two days before the gig, and we go over some charts that might be played. And I come to the gig, of course, a uh, little, little nervous, but by that time, I kind of feel like, you know, I just have to, to play, just have to do well. just. Uh, and 
the band is all star studded, all people you just dream of playing with, you know, Amy Henderson's there sure. and Randy Berger playing trumpets. Uh, John Stubblefield, may he rest in peace, and he's on tenor. Ronnie Kuber, also gone now uh, on baritone. Uh, David Kikoski, who who's one of my uh, best friends, and uh, you know, I've been playing with him a lot. And over the pandemic, we put out the duo record. I know, I love that one. Yeah, I, I love that well, one. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah, that, that's an interesting story of that record too. So he, they own the band, and like. I'm kind of talking to myself, say, you know what? You could be uh, have psychosis over being worried about playing with and in front of all those people, or you can just have fun. And I was able to do, uh, I think, pretty well on the gig, all things considered. Uh, Sue Mingus, uh, strangely, was not there that night. She usually she was always there, sitting in her booth that was designated for her. It, uh, it became kind of like an institution. You walk in and you see uh, Mingus Ben and you see Booth where Sue Mingus sits and you'll never know who would be sitting with her. I, I saw uh, Elvis Costello who eventually did things with Mingus Orchestra. Uh, I saw, well, of course, Sia Johnson, uh, now departed also, Chief Arranger. He was there yeah. most of the time. Uh, a couple of times I saw Jason Newstead who played bass for Metallica at, at the time. He would be sitting there. Really? Or Alec Baldwin, the actor, would, would be at that booth. So you, you never knew who would you see there. And like I said, Sue was not there that, that particular Thursday. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, you know, I'm so grateful for this opportunity to thank Tommy again, met everybody in the band. Uh, two days later on Saturday. Oh, but so on Saturday, I get uh, a phone call from Sue Mingus, and uh, she says, well, can you come in next Thursday and play again? And of course, I'm, of course I'll do it, you know. Uh, but I'm absolutely amazed. I said, Miss Mingus, uh, why are you calling me? Because you, you never heard me. And here comes the lesson in democracy, as I call it. She said, I didn't have to hear you. I made 14 phone calls. Oh, wow. <laughs> Meaning that she called everybody in the band, and I don't know exactly about the percentage or ratio, but basically I was kind of voted in. And things uh, keep progressing. The next Thursday I come in, and innocently I ask because... Uh, by that time, there were already a lot of minus one Abersolds floating around. And I would get some of them on study, like in particular the Coltrane, called like Countdown to Giant Steps or something. Uh, Andy Laverne, who was part of the recording, he even hired me to present it at one of the uh, IAG conferences. So I love those things for practicing and so forth. And I asked Sue, I said, Miss Mingus, uh, I would like to study the music better. Is there a minus one for Mingus? And she thinks for two seconds, she said, no, there's no minus one for Mingus, but why don't you make one? And I'm just staring at her like, what do you mean, why don't you make one? She said, well, there's none, you know, here. So uh, we have a hookup with Hal Leonard's company. Why don't you produce minus one? And that became such a project because I was just starting to uh, immerse myself in Mingus's music, and all of a sudden I had to produce something that would require a lot of knowledge. You know, uh, her office was there, and it was open for musicians 24-7. Uh, like, if you wanted to research something, you would come. It was basically, uh, well, Mingus was the first uh, African-American composer whose entire uh, body of works was purchased by Library of Congress. Almost the reflection of that was in Sue's apartment in multiple drawers and everything was marked and you could come in. So uh, once we narrowed down the songs that we would record for Minus One, uh, I went in and researched five or six versions of each one. And that kind of, looking back, that prepared me for 
the modus operandi that I would have approaching arranging making this music later on, yeah. of which Sue and the band always been supportive. And uh, some scores were published by Hal Leonard's, and I'm really happy about all those chances. But I would do the same thing if I research a piece that has not yet been arranged for the Mingus Man or the orchestra. I would see how many versions of that I can yeah. listen to and the common traits that occur in every version of that uh, of those songs. Uh, that would be something that obviously stays in the arrangement. And the rest I had a freedom of adding, you know, yeah. based on the ideas of how the band plays or based on the ideas of how particular people in the band, you know, could, could treat it, things like that. So that was a massive project for me to do this uh, play along. Sue called everything more than a, more than. She had this book, which is probably the most accurate book of Mingus's uh, scores and, and themes, and she called it more than a fake book. <laughs> Because the tons of stories, photographs, and uh, you know quotes and so forth, so she called this uh, project more than a play along. And what was more was not only stories and quotes and photos, but there was a second CD with Seamus Blake, the great tenor saxophonist mm -hmm. Seamus Blake, actually not being taken out like it is on the minus one recording, but you could hear him play full versions of all the songs. So there were two CDs and uh, the minus one would be in all the keys and E flat, B flat, and bass oh, flat, wow. and so forth. Uh, as separate books, not all in one book, like Jamie Abersold Productions would be doing. And of course, Tommy Campbell was the drummer on that uh, project. And John Hicks, uh, may he rest in peace, he probably put more uh, wisdom and knowledge in the, in that book and CD than I could ever do because he just knew how things would go. He would even look at the uh, music in more than a Fay book and he would say like, mm. no, no, there's one chord here that's slightly inaccurate and he just knew this stuff. So he would go and help me with penciling the right stuff on the charts and it was amazing, you know. So uh, okay. shortly after that, uh, Sue asked me to go, would you like to go on the road? I remember the band was going to uh, Albuquerque and Tucson and uh, the Rodozo, like those lands, uh, which was first time for me in, in that too, and it was incredible, like, seeing the indigenous uh, yeah. villages in New Mexico and, and unpaved roads on which the bus would go for like 100 miles. I didn't know that unpaved roads existed. Uh, but I was surprised and I was kind of like a little uneasy because the bass player who, uh, there were a few bass players who played uh, before me and concurrently still played and still play now. When, uh, one of them was John Benitez from mm -hmm. whom I actually, I actually had to go to the house in the Bronx and get the spare uh, parts to study at home before my first uh, gig with the Mingus man. Uh, another bass player was uh, Andy McKee, mm. great bassist who played with uh, many uh, many people, and uh, he was in Michelle Petru Chinese man at the yeah. time when I met him. And he was extremely kind to me. Of, he was a house bassist at Manila, those sessions on Mondays where Craig Handy would be playing tenor. Uh, my countryman Valerie Panamara on trumpet, uh, Joe Locke, and Andy McKee and Victor Jones, that was the man, and amazing. Yeah. And he was super nice, Andy. I'm talking about 91, 92, you know, six, seven years before this Mingus band thing happening. And I felt uneasy, you know, I still didn't know how to approach those things from the standpoint of ethics or business, or, uh, and I definitely didn't want to, as much as, you know, as much as I was excited to do the band, uh, I felt uneasy about taking somebody else's place. And when Sue called me to go on the road, I said, Sue, but what about these other guys who did the band before me? And all of a sudden her voice uh, 
turned to this really strict character and she said, well, that's none of your business. Would you like to go on the road? And I understood, okay. But it, eventually I would learn how things were working and rotating in, in this kingdom. But uh, I didn't ask those questions anymore. Okay, I went on the road. <laughs> and at the same time, she offered me to play because uh, I think Andy had just better bass and he loved his and he wouldn't want to play Mingus's bass. John Minid has played it on occasion, uh, but I don't think John was there all the time because he had many other things. Yeah. So I got Charles Mingus's bass at my disposal, and not only for the spiritual value, not only for the form factor because it's a slender, very well played, thin, resonant bass that I imagined for Mingus with his towering figure, it was like like a mandolin, you know. Yeah, joy. Yeah, yeah. But not only all that and the fact that Mingus played it and uh, you know all the photos with the bass and all the footage all those things aside another deal with a bass was that it was such a huge upgrade from my uh, semi plywood check <laughs> uh, and I'm saying that it was a very important period of time because I started hearing different sounds that can be brought out from the bass and I started feeling like I know what to look in the mm -hmm. base for at this point. But even if you have enough experience, it can still be intimidating to think of like what base you want to get, uh, what are you looking for in it, what you're trying to achieve. Uh, yeah. I felt like Mingus's base taught me uh, those things. Like I loved what was coming out and uh, like to this day, you know, you go on the road, uh, the times of traveling with your own acoustic bass are long gone. Yep. Uh, you play what we call bass du jour all the time, and that helps me to approach maybe a bass that's totally foreign to me or just mediocre an instrument. And within certain parameters, I'm able to establish some kind of positive thing positive relationship that I can have with that particular base du jour Excellent. today. Yeah. And I think Ming is based on that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, uh, that's Mingus story. And uh, going back to Wait transfer, one of the perks that I get in transfer is that uh, you have to play both this all the time. Uh, basically, the way it looks, you show up for the gig, and uh, they have a very solid team working for them. So you show up for the gig, the two ready rigs, and I endorse Gelling Kruger, and uh, they're beautiful people, and they make great instruments, and I've been playing them for close to 40 years now. Uh, and they, they're easy to procure, so usually it's two Gelling Krugers, uh, the head on 4 by 10 and that's all I need. And I bring my own electric bass, and there's an upright bass, and the program is half and half. Hmm. And that really helps because oftentimes, uh, in part because, you know, the jazz scene is so, uh, you know, there's a proclivity for mostly acoustic music, yeah. especially in New York. And uh, part of it is we joke, you know, saying that jazz police would, not like electric bass to be part of the uh, the scene. Of course, it's a joke because there are plenty of sure. uh, incredible, constantly working electric bassists uh, in New York. I can, well, Matt Garrison, who has his own club in Brooklyn, yeah. uh, you know, of course he plays on tours all the time, but he's New York based. That's what I'm saying. And he, uh, and the myriads of great bassists, uh, Leo Traversa, with whom I shared certain gigs and he's uh, playing all the time, you know. Ruben Rodriguez is stalwart of uh, electric bass and uh, Latin music. Uh, well, I can go on and on, you know. People, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. Just live in New York and do electric gigs, but for every guy playing electric bass somewhere in New York uh, in the jazz field, they, they, they'd be uh, 10 guys playing upright. 
so naturally when you tend to uh, keep your, your yourself occupied in a jazz world uh, even if you play electric bass nobody really cares or knows it so in a way the transfer road gig allows me to always come back in touch with my electric bass side which I still consider to be my main instrument uh, I play way more upright gigs, but uh, electric is my like first and original passion still. Mm. And like I say, hearing guys doing new things is just mesmerizing. The, the first time I heard Matt Garrison at uh, way back at the Village Gate, I think he was super young. He was maybe 22, something like that. He was, he was playing with Andy Milne, and, mm -hmm. uh, and it was the last year of the and I remember listening to him, and I didn't know even who he was, but I was thinking to myself, man, this is how I always heard electric bass in my head, but never heard anybody play it or be able to play myself. And it's almost the same feeling, even more over the top, when I first uh, saw Anthony Jackson play live. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh. Like, you can do yeah. this with electric yeah. bass, you can sound like that. You, you can uh, develop this sort of ideas and put them in sounds on, on this instrument. Uh, actually, it's uh, hearing Anthony Jackson and seeing him uh, that contributed to me switching to six string forever. Uh, even before I knew what he played, I was looking for my own bass during this in many months during this stint uh, with the Russian studio band playing swing music in Long Island. Uh, they had their own uh, Fender bass, which belonged to the studio, and I very much enjoyed playing it because I didn't have my own. And I was actively looking, and I was aware of the existence of basses other than uh, jazz bass type yeah. or precision bass type. I would already see five five string bases and six. Uh, but I kept my options open. I, I just knew that I need to buy my own electric base uh, during the time when we're here and making low money. Uh, I wasn't sure that I would be staying in the States or, or not. It was just a stint. And I started, uh, it's almost like a Darwin method. I started looking around and uh, now sadly the only couple of stores in the, in Manhattan where you can go and try things out. Back then, between Manhattan, Bronx, uh, Brooklyn, Queens, Long Island, and Jersey, I've been to close to 200 stores. <laughs> and uh, and private people too. Cause, and, you know, places like 48th Street, you would come and there were eight stores just on 48th Street. And you would try everything from the cheapest back then Korean-made uh, you know, honey dollar thing to what eventually became, uh, you know, my favorite instrument made by Federer guitars. Mm -hmm. So with with the Darwinistic method of just trying things, I stumbled upon Federer bass. And clearly, I could not afford something that was over $5,000. Yeah. But the amazing thing was that I would try they could only be found in two stores in, in the city. One of them was Ru Rudy's Music. But I would try it, and I would try another one which would be totally different, like not even six string, five string. And I would try this and that. First of all, they felt like they were just molded in your hand. Uh, the next thing was that no matter how what you did with the knobs, and, you know, I, of course, when you take a new bass, you don't know what the hell is going on there. And I never played active basses before. Any sound that you would produce is good, like it's pleasing. And I just asked the uh, very kind salesperson, uh, I said, where do these basses come from? Like, if I look for used one. And he said, oh, you know, very easy. they in Brooklyn. Uh, the address is uh, like 68 uh, 34th Street. And... Uh, I remember making that trip to Federer Guitars uh, on N-Train. I figured out on the map, like, okay, what I didn't figure out is that 
the way the American uh, address is written, it's the opposite of how people people do it probably in Slovenia too. Because yeah. here, 68, 34th Street, first comes the building number, then the street number. In our realm back home, it would be the opposite. Yeah, yeah. First there would exactly. be a street, and then yeah. the, the house. So on N train, I went to 68th Street to uh, instead of 34th, uh, only to spend two hours and to figure out and eventually ask somebody, and they would say, like, no, no, you have to go to 34th Street. Then I go to 34th Street, meet everybody at Fodera. They were super nice, and uh, they still are, after all things they've been through, they super attentive to musicians. Mm. And... Uh, they offered me an instrument which was on, on demo and much cheaper, but I still could not afford it because with the money I, I saved, I, I had to buy a TV for my mother because my mother didn't have TV at, at that time. We didn't have TV in Moscow. just couldn't afford it. So I bought TV and I bought a, a 78 Fender Jet Bass, which I'm glad I did because once in a while people call you and they want... Uh, you in the studio playing old Fender bass, and that's a good thing to have, even yeah. though I don't play it day to day. Once in a while, I want, when I teach four stringers, I, I use that. So the good thing I did, but uh, fast forward, one day, um, uh, I think it was 92, I already made a, what I call, would call permanent move to New York. I'm playing a Columbus Circle at the station, just do an upright bass and trumpet. Out comes one of the guys who was working at Federer Guitars, and he would say, like, oh, I remember you. You you came to Federer, right? And boom, 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 like, oh, yeah, now I'm permanent, just, you know, trying to survive playing on the street. He said, okay, we'll help you. Uh, the next thing was uh, that James Genus, this great bass player and, uh, you know, amazing work with so many people over the years. Uh, right before the pandemic, I heard him with the Herbie Hancock's band. Yeah, yeah that's Tokyo Jazz Festival. Killing. He happened to stop by. He didn't play. He just stopped by to say hi to a few people at Visiones, where the jam session was. And I think I wasn't even in the house band. I was uh, sitting in, replacing uh, Ed Howard, who was super happy to to leave that jam part to me. He just played a set with Eddie Henderson, and like, man, you got it. And I'm happy to play with all these people. I didn't know James Genus was in the audience, and I don't think James, uh, he doesn't actually remember doing that now when we talk, but he was already a Federer client, and he came in the next day, and my name came up somehow that you know I was playing in the street. I moved, and he said, oh, I heard that guy. He's good. And I think that kind of sealed uh, my standing in with Federer people. Oh, wow. And uh, Vincent Federer, and at that time, uh, Vladimir uh, Lazarev, and now uh, Vadim Medved, and uh, then uh, now they have like a really serious team. Back then it was much smaller, and uh, they were really doing everything by hand, yeah. and they were in debt. But no matter how much in debt they would be, they would never sell out, not to Yamaha, not to Gibson. Like Vincent Ferrer is a true artist. He's Now they're doing good and they established a commercial brand and they now they have like Searly instruments along with completely handmade and yeah. you can them. And they're really good at implementing like exactly what you want. Like it, you, you, you don't have to order like, you know, this model or that model, like Imperial or whatever they call it, they just, they can do completely custom things for you. And they cater to some collectors who would not necessarily be professional musicians who can afford sculpture-like bass incrustated with pearls yeah. and things like that. And because of that clientele, they being able to deal with musicians, and it's really like who's who of modern bass who are being their clients, and and that's not 
how I chose it because, you know, I didn't know Anthony Jackson played for there at the time. I just heard the records. I didn't know. Uh, I didn't know who Victor Wooten was, but I met him because I heard his name in Ferrer Guitars. And, and uh, Lincoln Goins, whose book, uh, Funky Fine, the Clave, I was studying to get my inroads in, into Caribbean music. He, he has a model with them. He is one of the people. And Tom Kennedy, who mm -hmm. I loved his playing on old Connors tape at the time, uh, he has the model there. And Matt Garrison, whom I heard way before any of those, he, Matt was just playing his old Yamaha five string. He eventually became uh, their client too. So people who know how to look for the good thing, they, they know the good thing. Yeah, 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 it's an incredible. And that's yeah. Yeah. they became really, even though I might not see them uh, much, but they like a family, you know. Hmm. Vince is truly the uh, artist and so attentive, you know, he loves the music too. And they once in a while they say, Oh, I heard you on the radio, they're playing music in the shop all the time. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. That, that, that so you, I, you got that, yeah. That is to conclude the thought that I love my electric bass. I love uh, playing electric bass. I had a few of my own bands playing uh, just electric bass. And uh, the label where um, that I can't say sign because he doesn't sign anybody, but that I've been associated with for uh, the last three to four years, maybe longer, five years. Uh, Positone yeah. out of LA that they've always been kind of like very straight ahead uh, acoustic music label for many years. Uh, Mark Free, who is the uh, the owner and producer, he now once over the pandemic we were doing all, all sorts of things. Uh, he kind of established the house rhythm section, which would be uh, Art Here Hard, Woody Royston, and myself, and a lot of artists recorded with that. And eventually he asked me to record my own and uh, after using electric bass on a few tracks with other projects, he let me use electric bass on mine. And I felt not only amazing he did that, I also felt kind of a little proud like, oh, maybe it was me who pushed the label in a slightly different direction. Uh, now in May, Mark wants me to do uh, predominantly electric record. Oh, beautiful! Like a new one for Positone or a new one? Yeah, he oh, he beautiful. he's uh, he's Los Angeles based, and his partner, who's also a main engineer, uh, Nick O'Toole, he's Portland, Oregon based. So two or three times a year, they coordinate the you know the the time frame with us, mainly with the art. Kerhar, Rudy, myself, and maybe Ben Gillies and a few other key people, musicians for the label, all New York based or East Coast based. They come here for 10 days and that becomes, uh, well, it's right in between hell and heaven. It's yeah, just a marathon when you, you almost make one record a day. You in the studio from like 10 a.m. to 11 p.m. And sometimes it's such an overflow of music that you can't remember what you played a few hours ago. But they have to do it this way because they lay based and they just come here yeah. and the tape just rolls. And uh, the next, the, the last one was in the beginning of February uh, when they came and we, uh, I didn't do every single record. There were other, you know, bands with other basis and I did most of it. I think we did eight albums in 11 days with one day off in between. Oh man. I mean that, that that's what I did. They did, they did more. They had other that's bases crazy. and they had an organ base and they had no bass bands. So that's that's how they work and you know you just roll with it and uh, they, they get a lot of good stuff out and yeah. I'm really happy about that association because uh, they really, you know, and that's probably not for everybody, somebody who's really hands-on in producing things, 
but when I did my previous record, and of course, you know, it was done at, at the tail end of the, well, maybe even like in the thick of the pandemic, you know, all of a sudden you're in the studio with, playing with guys, they, they were getting on Zoom and making maybe one, two records a month as opposed to, yeah. and those were blessed, you know, times when we had a chance to do that, because again, the pandemic, nobody's playing together. And uh, I did my record, and for once, I really, I was really appreciative of being produced. Maybe that's the thing about being sideman. Yeah, ninety percent of my time. Maybe it's a thing of actually having, you know, thinking partner who can uh, throw ideas at you, who can make suggestions. But I really enjoy the process. I have to say. And uh, he's pretty open. Like you don't have to implement everything that he suggests. Uh, the main thing still comes from you, but he's always on hand and kind of, you know, filters a little bit. And the other guys like Art here, Har and, and Rudy, and, and Ben Gillies, the vibraphone player, they all know the process, and they can. Oh, they become part of it too. And there's yeah. so many good things that floating. You just have to kind of uh, grab onto it. And Art is super experienced. Uh, and he's self-produced a lot of things, and he, produced, he produces a lot of people. So he has a great uh, way of being able to kind of like mentally stand back and look at things. Uh, you're not part of it. So yeah. he's definitely an asset. And, uh, you know, so I've, I've been pretty happy with the positive. Uh, how, how, did you decide, know, how, how did you decide, decide for to, Donnie to add Donnie for your last record? You know, it again, it was mostly, you know, I didn't have to decide. I was just like, man, that's killing. <laughs> because uh, Mark and Donnie, they, they go way back. Uh, like really, you know, way back in time, back to mm. like being in the youth youth years in California. For me, it was not just bringing a, a star a saxophonist on, on the album. For me, it was, uh, you know, reconnecting with the musical family member because mm. yeah. uh, I yeah. played with Donnie in multiple projects, including the Mingus band that, that you know, he played in shortly. Sue loved them. Uh, then Donnie was uh, the main, and actually at the time, probably the only saxophonist who played with uh, Monday Michiro, who was a great vocalist mm -hmm. and flautist and uh, very well known in Japan. At some point, we were touring Japan twice a year, and Donnie would be playing tenor and flute on that. Uh, then Donnie had me play with him every week at the time when I was kind of like in, in the quartet uh, at 55 bar. And it's a very sad thing that they're no longer there. Oh, man, yeah. It's, it's, there's so much history in that place. And it, it's just, it was an institution. So I did two projects with Donnie. One, well, maybe more than two, the, the, the standard quartet that uh, he would have for quite a while. And that's way before he acquired his star quartet with Tim and Jason, you know, the, that's before all of that. And the band would be Ben Munder on the guitar. And uh, the drummers would be Adam Cruz, Cruz mostly yeah. would be there on drums. Uh, Dan Weiss would come in uh, also. Mm. But mostly it was Adam Cruz, Ben Munder, and myself. And mm -hmm. there was a band. That band didn't tour much. He had a trio recording with Jonathan Blake and Hans Glebishnik. It was brilliant bassist, one yeah, of yeah. the contemporaries, whom, whom when I listen to, I, I, I have a feeling like I wouldn't be able to, to play anything better. And he uh, he got a gig now with the the, uh, the band, in, uh, what's that radio band in uh, Frankfurt? Oh, really? Oh, okay. Uh, so Hans, yeah, he's been there for quite a while now. He okay. he mostly spends his time in Europe. 
And uh, of course, good for him, and you know, nobody else deserves this gig more. But it's just I, I kind of miss having him. We we've done the same many of the same gigs, you know, over the years. Even like I kind of followed him. He was the subbing on the bass with Mambo Mokoko, and then I came in. Then he was doing Ray Barreto in the New World Spirit, and then I came in after him. <laughs> and at one point, we were like the. I, 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 and same band, the same, uh, same thing with the Sunday at Smoke with Sayatos. Uh, you, they wouldn't even care who comes. They're just like, oh, if you cannot do it, call Hans. And we would be just, okay, who's covering Sunday? So I, I really miss him. Uh, they had a beautiful trio recording of uh, Hans and Jonathan Blake. So I came in to tour with that group. Uh, on acoustic bass with Jonathan and Donnie. And we mm, okay. did like a lot of big chunks of United States. And the next touring we did was, uh, that was very cool for me. It was Adam and I had to play electric bass and I had to figure out a lot of stuff that would cover Munder's role, you know? Oh shit, that's I had to right. do a lot of chords, a lot, lot of guitaristic things. And that was very interesting for me. and. Uh, there's a copy of Life from Bim House somewhere. Uh, not, not published CD, just something that they record over the board. Yeah. And I'd like to go back and check it out and, and see what I what, what I can still do. You know, so to finish that, uh, you know, sorry, I'm I'm answering every uh, oh, no, man, I love questions. With, oh, please. That's why we're here. With, 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 the, with the book, you know, I, no. I don't intend to do that, but I don't want to leave any details out because... Uh, you know, some people might find it interesting. So bringing Donnie into this recording, which was eventually called First Things First, yeah. it was, like I said, like uniting with a, with a musical family member. And Donnie would instinctively know what, what you meant without ever talking about it. Just that's the type of... Uh, musicianship and level of knowledge and just you know and uh, there's nothing you you even have to say yeah yeah you just put a piece of music and yeah he's just a, go he's yeah. Incredible, yeah and Donny once in a while he comes in and does things for Positone and uh, it's it's always a blessing on other people's you know he played on Art Hirahara's album which is beautiful the quartet uh, from last year. It's magical. Yeah, he's he's such a such an amazing player, man. Yeah. Uh, you know, foreign players. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you how did how did you end up on that gig with Michael Brecker, and w what was that like for you? You know, him being at least for me one of the biggest heroes on the instrument or in general. I mean, oh. You know, uh, well, I guess I was just in line of succession. <laughs> uh, the way uh, I can again go back and uh, you know give you the long version, but I'll try to shorten it. No, 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 probably. You have things to do. I got to go soon, but uh, you know, a lot of things happen from uh, association with the Mingus Big Band. You know, I I got. Uh, like Jonathan Blake, who, who shortly came uh, after time, because Tommy Campbell brought me in the band, and he, he moved to Japan for 12 years, mm. two weeks later. So Jake Jackson, who was also playing with Herbie Hancock along with, with Craig Candy, he came in, but he was really busy, so young Jonathan Blake joined the band, and we became tight, even though we have 10 years between us. He's 10 years younger. So he hooked me up with his father, John, John Blake, with whom I proceeded to play till. Till John passed away, and oh, I'm on three yeah, albums, okay. and that was an incredible journey. Uh, another very tight musical association, and uh, I'm on two of his records, and we toured uh, quite a bit. And he is one of my favorite musicians in the world, and he actually played in Michael's uh, Quindic Tattoo, and that's Robin Eubanks. Yeah, yeah. And that connection, of course, would not be ha happening. And Robin loves electric stuff, so he, like first time ever I used like a bass synthesizer was on Robin's record, like recorded bass synthesizer, and it was like, 
oh, you got it? Yeah, use it. You know, so uh, a lot of those things they came out of Mingus, man. All my connections in the uh, Latin world, they did not go through Mingus, man. They, they went through maybe like my street playing days and Jay Collins, a uh, great town of player, he initially connected me with Mabo Makoko and then with Bobby Sanabria. And, uh, and then you just meet people, you know. Sure. And then Brian Lynch, with whom I played a lot, you know, great, great trumpet player, arranger, composer. And then he hooked me up with Eddie Palmieri. And we had a band quartet with Eddie for, for seven years. Mm. And one time I subbed for Lucas Curtis, who was his regular bass player in the Salsa Orchestra. And uh, I did the tour. 2013 big tour with Salsa Orchestra. That was something else. That's the loudest I ever played my any bass ever in my life. Because it's Salsa Orchestra and Eddie likes a lot of bass, and uh, I I do not have a know how to play baby bass, which they use in the band. So they had our price for me, and there was an eight by ten fridge behind me with Ampeg head, and okay. every note I play would move me like a sail, you know. So all other connections were through the Mingus band, and one of the most important ones was, was David Kikowski, who uh, I joined in 98. He, uh, in 2000, he suggested that I come in as a substitute for Ed Howard, who was in Bob Berg's band at the time. Mm, and okay. Bob was having a tour in Europe, and Ed Howard was playing with Wayne Shorter. That, like, he had a stint with Wayne Shorter. So Dave recommended me, and I come in the band, and it was just great. Like Bob liked it. Uh, Gary Novak played drums, mm. amazing. You know, he I, I knew him from all, all the recordings with uh, with Chicks Electric Chick, Band, yeah, sure. but he's an incredible jazz drummer. So Dave did that. Then Dave uh, had me on two records in 2001, uh, both for. Uh, the Japanese label. We toured Japan and recorded two two records. One was uh, Quintet with Alex C. Pagan and Seamus Blake, and uh, Jeff Tane Watson drums. And uh, the other one was a trio with Kikoski and Tane, Jeff Tane Watts. So initially, uh, it it was Tane who, again, maybe without meaning to really. Uh, Plugged me in, but he somehow Tank was Tank was playing with Michael in in the, in the quartet setting for many many years. Uh, one block from the edge, I remember the record. Mm -hmm. I I loved it so much. I just yeah. wore it out, you know. Well, you can't wear a CD out, but you know what I mean. I know what you mean. Yeah. So uh, the next uh, project of Dave's that Dave kind of invited me to play in. Uh, and it was a lot of honor for me because one of the bass, bassists I knew even back home, uh, one of the few albums that I had and loved of Art Blakey's was uh, the album of the year, it's called. It's from the er early 80s, and uh, the bassist on that was Charles Fambro, mm -hmm. who yeah. left us very early. And he was part of the uh, trio called Beatle Jazz. It's the interpretations of Brian Melvin, the yeah. drummer, David Kikoski, of Beatles music. And when they had the next incarnation of Beatles jazz, which toured uh, Japan and played here a little bit, uh, went to, to Philly for a week and did a radio, uh, Dave invited me. Brian liked me. We hooked up. Uh, and uh, one of the recordings they had, Kind of like the core trio, but then they had soloists, extra soloists come in. And uh, Mike Stern, who played amazing acoustic guitar, which is something you would never see at 55 bar, where he played every Wednesday with like two two amps. Yeah, yeah. Uh, played amazing acoustic guitar on that. Then John Scofield and uh, Mike Michael Brecker was one of the. Uh, uh, I think he. Played, he played this killing solo, and I think it was Working's Man, uh, Beatles song. And we 
you know, we shook hands and then we uh, listened to the take we just did, and he says, like, man, you sound good. You know, Tane told me about you. And that, that was the end of that, like, okay, thanks to Tane, you know, and I'm happy to be with Michael in the studio. And then the next thing I know, the uh, Queen Dictator record is being recorded, which won deservingly so every mm -hmm. possible award, of course. And uh, a lot of friends are playing in that band, Roger Rosenberg on uh, uh, bass player and, and baritone, and uh, Bob Shepard, whom I knew, and uh, Robbie Newbanks on trombone, and Alex Sipiagin on trumpet, and Adam Rogers on guitar. A lot of people I know, so they do that, and John Paretucci is a bassist on the, the album, and he sounds incredible. Uh, the next thing uh, they playing, and I wasn't there, I just hear, okay, they're doing Iridium for five days or a week or some, and it's Larry Grenadier who plays bass. And the next thing, they really got some tours for the Quindictet, and the way it was organized, Quindictet could not be Quindictet all the time because uh, to Japan they took the original one, but to Europe they took the core band with the uh, uh, only rhythm section and, and, and trumpet and, and guitar. Yeah. Uh, and they needed a basis, and obviously JP or Larry could not be on hand. They would, you know, JP played with Wayne Shorter and tons of other people, and I think Larry was tied into so many situations, including they had this band Fly at some yeah, point with Mark, Mark Turner and, and Joe. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so, uh, you know, I guess, like I said 20 minutes ago, it was a line of succession. And uh, Michael uh, remembered me from that uh, record date, and Gil Goldstein, who was chief arranger and conductor in, in the Quindictet and playing uh, piano, keyboards, and accordion. He knew me because he was at the onset of Mingus Orchestra, which Sue Mingus mm. kind of created all anew. Uh, and we played at Berlin every Tuesday starting in 2000, maybe two years down the line from the point when I joined the Mingus band. And Gil knew me from working there. So when my name popped up, like, yeah, let's have him, you know, so Japan was the first destination where we went. And, uh, yeah, the last two years, uh, the Sextet was kind of like in between the Quindictet gigs. When we went to Japan initially, it was not a Quindictet, it was a uh, Sextet. Oh, wow. They, wow. Now they only have one blue note left in Japan, which is in Tokyo, uh, where we played two weeks ago going to Japan for the first time uh, since pandemic was almost like spiritual experience <laughs> after not being there for so long. Uh, back then they had Blue Note in Nagoya, uh, in Fukuoka, in Osaka. Yeah. So we did uh, Nagoya and Fukuoka, uh, we did with the sextet. So we started with the sextet. And then the original American Quindictet came in Osaka. And we played there and then moved to Tokyo. And that was the first one. And then uh, Michael still had his quartet. Uh, you know, they, they toured here and there, uh, which consisted of Joey Calderazzo, his longtime associate on the piano, uh, Tane on drums, and uh, Chris Mangdoki was playing bass. Mm, yeah. And it just so happened that in the summer of 2004, Chris had a baby, and Michael had some quartet hits. And I came in, uh, you know, and playing with Tane was familiar. Uh, music did not really cross, it did not cross, he was doing completely different tunes with the quartet, so uh, it was a very interesting experience. I had to kind of reset my head and play with Michael in a different setting. Uh, and of course, you know, everything he played was just... Uh, I remember one night in Tokyo, he would always play... I'm sure you remember the version of his version of Solo Naima. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, originally from the recording called Directions, 
Yeah, uh, with Herbie. And, yeah, yeah. And it was Herbie's part. project. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So he, like, since probably the original recording, he developed more ideas and he added more things. And he did a lot of solo stuff uh, throughout the gig, you know, like, uh, remember his uh, uh, piece called Delta Blues? Mm hmm. Uh, which originally was uh, developed in the quartet setting, but then Gil wrote an arrangement for the live stuff, and he would the, the the melody on it, pump, 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 like almost impossible intervals on. Yeah. But he would play an intro to that, which was kind of you know like uh, the melody itself on on some some other kind of drugs, and. Uh, you know, he was doing that. He was doing a lot of solo EV because uh, the new EV prototype was just then, you know, created. And uh, he was basking in EV. He, he, he would sit days mm. and nights through practicing in the room. He would create things that you could not understand how were created, like textures and uh, harmonies. And he loved the fact that, because I would go see Barker Brothers uh, in 92 at the Blue Note and Michael was playing the serial Akai Eevee and he had two big racks uh, with the uh, Kurzweil and Akai uh, samplers and stuff and uh, it was so complicated. He loved the fact that his setup in 2004 was a table, a laptop and, and, yeah. and an instrument itself, nothing else. Not even a pedal board because all the switching that previously had to be done at the pedal board, everything was done in the outer ranges of the instrument. And later on, I asked him a lot, and then later on, uh, when we had a band with Shameless, and Shameless played uh, a lot of EV, and I was asking, how do you do that? And he would just show me the certain rollers that you access with a thumb. What, what instrument do you play? Uh, guitar. Guitar, that's right. Yeah. You told me, sorry. So uh, I think there's like eight octaves on, on the EV. And I remember Michael was the first one to explain how he does the MIDI switching. He says the outer ranges of the instrument, they uh, not assigned to nodes, but they assign to MIDI signals. Mm -hmm. So okay. he would quick, quickly roll with the thumb. I can't remember on which hand. Maybe there's some controller on both thumbs, you know. Quickly roll to the zone where the instrument doesn't produce the MIDI node, but it produces the uh, MIDI signal. And that signal would switch something in logic uh, or in the appropriate sound module, you know. And uh, yeah, it, it was amazing. And uh, that Naima, you know, he would play it every night. Okay, we played in Osaka, and then we're playing it in Tokyo. And by Thursday night, his version of Naima, which came in the middle of the set, it kind of like left everybody just with the jaw dropped. Even the veterans of his band, like Adam Rogers, who heard it hundreds of times, he would be just like looking around like everybody else. Man, like, how do you find an inner sense of why you even have to play after this? Mm. How can you finish the set after what just happened? It was that kind of like unified feeling from from everybody on stage and, and in the audience. Mm. So uh, those things I definitely remember on like very emotional level. Yeah. yeah. And Mike always practicing and he was so thoughtful, you know, a couple of flights and we have to go and play in, to sound check in a couple hours and some guys uh, fast forward summertime in Europe some guy would just go sit outside and have lunch and beer uh, he, some guys would go to sleep you know like take a quick nap he would go in the room and practice Eevee and sometimes he would practice Eevee not to create things on Eevee he would just do so because he didn't want to disturb people sleeping with a tenor. Oh, well. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. He would never play uh, his tenor in the hotel. 
because you know just thinking of the guys in the band like especially you don't want to disturb anybody after two flights when you're about to go to play and then uh, there'd be uh, board recordings and I kept asking Michael can you show me especially the first trip I'm just getting into it would you be kind to let me uh, uh, hear that and okay I'll do it tomorrow later later so at the end of the tour I say Michael uh, sorry to say but I kept asking you for those recordings you, you never gave me one he said well you don't need it especially now you you got it uh, I said, why you never gave it to me he said I didn't want you to hear it I played I, I didn't play well on those yeah 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 so the, the uh, just level of you know humbleness and uh, amazing conversations, amazing uh, life stories, you know, uh, amazing sense of humor too. Mm. Yeah, it's you know, a Adam told me, yeah, Rogers. I mean, you know, he played with with mm -hmm. for twenty years, I think, almost or so. For a long time, I know. Uh, 10, 15, maybe. Yeah. In many different configurations, too. Yeah. And Adam was able to, I mean, I understand it's, you know, common mm, techniques, you know, for guitarists. You just know what things do, what guitars do. But still, like the way Adam was able to find uh, textures and sounds yeah. for yeah. different things, be it sex or be it Quindictet, between his regular Gibson, and he brought SG as well, and was doing that like bridge-driven thing yeah. on, on SG. He found places where it's just like, ooh, you know. Yeah. Like if uh, you're thinking of adding some sort of uh, textural synthesizer to the group, you, you wouldn't have to because Adam, Adam found it all. No, no, he's amazing, you know, I, I love him, but such a player, man, so, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, he would jump on, uh, at the sound check, he would jump on the piano and just nail it. It's, it's like, like Brecker on drums, right? So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, the, uh, Antonio sent, sent a clip recently he found, uh, I think it's the sound check before the sound check in Japan, or maybe after the sound check, it's uh, Michael on drums and Adam on on, on piano. And Anto I don't know Antonio told me, it, yeah. But... Antonio told me it's just like, what is? It? <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy stuff. Man. But Man, cool. Antonio, that, that's yeah. another cat. Oh. Uh, so talking about like. Uh, musicality, stability, and the uh, ability to make everything sounds good. You, you know, there's a saying uh, in, in the bass world, they say, like, okay, you know, kind of uh, like a cocky sounding thing uh, and corny sounding thing, but somewhat true if you want to conceptualize it. People say, like, oh, make your drummer sound good. Meaning, like, whatever you do with the bass, do it in such a way that the the drum part uh, projects and sounds good and grooves and everything. Antonio was able to do that for the for the bass player. It, not only for the solos on the band, but for the bass player, because I know for a fact that I was not fully yet, to, you know, hundred percent in there. I'm not talking about notes playing. I'm, I'm talking about like the the flow, yeah. how you just eventually you find the right flow, but before that, man, he was covering a lot of stuff for me. Uh, he just does it. He, he has this incredible instinct, you know. It's it's not for nothing, you know. Yeah, he's... All these great people keep him. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Antonio was on you know, touring with Mathini uh, that year, so Clarence Penn came in. And he's another you know, amazing oh, drummer. Man. You know? I love that quartet with a Adam Brecker. And uh, Clarence. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's Scott yeah. Colley, right? Yeah. That's, that's yeah. some footage from Mexico City, I think, on YouTube. Yeah. Man. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's he's amazing, and I love uh, his. I think he killed Brian too. Uh, now he teaches in Orlando, so he moved. Mm. And I was lucky to be invited for this kind of like one time put together uh, Cafe Vivace in Cincinnati a couple of months ago with the uh, incredible Greg Tardy, mm. who is also Greg, living yeah. in. Uh, he's a, he's in uh, I think near Nashville teaching and uh, Clarence was on drums and uh, Alex Norris, my neighbor, great mm. trumpeter, came and uh, man, Clarence does some other things now and like he, he keeps going his own Clarence way somewhere. Just great musician. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing guy. Man, we, we could talk for hours, Boris. I did, we didn't even touch many things. The second part, I, I think. I I but I love that. Yeah. I don't have to play today. I mean, I could play. I have this uh, home recording project that uh, somebody, uh, or, you know, asked me to do. But I'm willingly taking a day off from instruments just because I played every week this week. Yeah, you know. it's good. It's smart. Yeah. And also, you know, just need to do other things. The you know some paperwork for this and that. Uh, you know, need to. Uh, Maybe watch a couple of documentaries. Yeah. Just hang around with the family. Exactly. Uh, my wife and my son, they know that I'm doing an interview, so we just sit quietly in a different you know, different room. So I, I have to let them loose pretty soon. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> definitely. That's cool. Man, thanks so much for sharing some of these thoughts and stories. It's so, so beautiful to hear this. So. And, uh, Thank you, and uh, you know, good luck with everything, and I hope life is good in Maribor. Yeah, yeah. We, I have a two-month daughter, daughter now, so it's we're quite busy. So. Oh man, congrats! What's what's your name? Uh, her name. Yeah, her name is Luna. Luna, oh beautiful! It's yeah, yeah. it's like a moon. Like the moon, exactly. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're. We're in that zone now. I love that name, but congrats on congrats on the daughter. And uh, my que- my last question to you would be: Do you get any sleep? <laughs> Getting well, you know, well, you know where you've been. So it's yeah, <laughs> it's it's getting there. But yeah, but cool. Boris, man, thanks so much, and uh, I'll try to catch you next time. I, I know you played with uh, Domingos in Graz, but I, I had a gig; I couldn't catch you. So, uh, oh, yeah, that's right. You 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 very close to Graz. Yeah. yeah, I'm like half an hour, and I saw you yeah. were playing. I was like, "Fuck, man!" I I had I, I had this gig, so I really wanted to see you, but then, yeah, couldn't. So, but next oh, time I, I'll try you. to catch you. So, did did you go to school in Graz? No, no, I'm self-taught. I mean, no. but I played with all these guys. You know, I played a lot with Donnie McCaslin also and mm-hmm. Gerald mm-hmm. Cleaver and David Beeney and all these guys you play with. So, Oh, beautiful. Man, Beeney is another uh, giant, you know, Ooh. just giant, super original, like Composer, everything is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a monster player. Out. Yeah. Well, yeah. see, he, he, he was also... Uh, you, you probably know it, but you know it's uh, such a loss not to have 55 because he was, you know, whatever you do when you know that one day a week you can come to 55 and you know that you're going to hear this incredible shit, uh, brand new, nothing like you heard before. It, it's a special feeling, you know? Yeah. And Beanie was, was in it, like even at the time when he moved to, California, he would still come back a couple of times a month and it would still be the, that institution that we used to for the last 20 years, you know. Yeah, yeah, the quartets with Dan and Jacob and Thomas, man, in the beginning. I saw them like in 2000 uh-huh. or something. Jesus, that was burning. Like those early stuff. Yeah. And then, you know, with Craig and Brian yeah, Blade, the... and that's mm-hmm. killing monsters. Yeah. Yeah, but cool. Boris, uh, free your. Oh, all right, Samo. <laughs> and thanks yeah, so much. Yeah, I, I let I let you know when this is out, and I'll send you a link. Thank you. Uh,